the recording is in progress. That means the webinar is starting. Welcome, everybody. It's another typo webinar. I haven't had one in 2020. It's 2022. I have to get that right. Uh, my name is Christopher Snyder. I'm your community and clinic success manager. I'm here to host and facilitate a lovely conversation, spotlighting experiences of seniors with diabetes. So we've got a patient. Hi, Joanne. We've got a bunch of providers. Thank you, all providers. We're going to go around the room, virtual room. Everybody's going to introduce themselves, um, share your connection with diabetes, and I guess for the icebreaker, cats or dogs. Um, we will start with patients first. Joanne, please introduce yourself to everybody. Hi, good morning, Christopher. Uh, oh, dogs. Oh, dogs. Seriously. Um, mostly because I'm allergic to cats, but um, yeah, dogs. Um, I, um, hi, I'm Joanne Milo. I have had type 1 diabetes. I just celebrated, if you do that, 57 years of living with T1D. I remember the exact day I was diagnosed and everything about it. Um, I am, I live in Southern California and have, um, I've been in the DIY community for the past uh, seven years um, and involved with, um, I started Loop and Learn, which is a Facebook group and a, a website to help people understand how to do closed loop systems. Right on. All right, let's go. I'm going to go left to right on my screen. Dr. Earl Hirsch, please introduce yourself. Good morning. My name is Earl Hirsch. I am at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, I've been here in the diabetes clinic for 32 years. I actually spend most of my time now doing research. Uh, most of my patients, about 80% or so, are type 1. And I have had my type 1 diabetes for 56 years. And between my brother and nephew and myself, we're way over a century. Wow. Oh, and cats. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, by far, cats. All righty. Uh, Dr. Lichman, you're up next. Hey, everyone. My name is Michelle Lichman. I'm a nurse practitioner and a diabetes researcher at the University of Utah. And um, I have family, both with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and definitely dogs because I'm also allergic to cats. All righty. And Dr. Allen. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. And I'm going to have to say good afternoon because we're on a different time zone here. Um, and I'm coming to you from the University of Utah College of Nursing. And I am also a nurse practitioner and a diabetes researcher. But I have to say that I just have a real passion for older adults, so much so that I transitioned uh, away from endocrinology about five years ago and did a fellowship in um, cognitive disorders and went to work just specifically so that I could specialize in working with older adults that have diabetes and they're experiencing some memory problems. So I'm so happy to be here. Right on. Uh, dogs or cats? Oh, definitely dogs. And I hope they don't interrupt. <laughs> All righty. Uh, I guess for me, I'm going to say both just because we have a dog and two cats. I'm going to split the difference there, but our dog will certainly let you know whenever UPS shows up. Um, all right. So uh, again, to sort of set the stage for what we're going to have here for the next hour-ish or so, here to have a conversation. Um, try and keep it as casual as possible. Um, there's a lot of you um, out there watching. There's a lot of you on the panel. Thank you all for attending. So I'm going to ask some open-ended questions. We're going to throw it around the wheel as we go. Attendees, if you have questions for our panelists, or maybe me, hopefully other panelists, um, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we're going to have ourselves a lovely little conversation. We're going to start, as we should, with the patient perspective. Uh, Joanne, no pressure. Um, but what does goal setting look like for you? Um, you know, Life with diabetes obviously is about the numbers. Um, you are obviously much more engaged than I would imagine the typical diabetes, person with diabetes because of your experience in the DIY community. But um, broadly speaking, what does goal setting look like for you as it relates to your age and your overall experience with living with diabetes? You are muted. Sorry, that is such an interesting question. Um, because I, I don't think I, in general, set goals. Um, having lived with diabetes for so long, goals are disappointing. The uh, plans are disappointing. So I generally kind of have a sense of what I want to do, and then I move forward. With respect to aging, um, it's very hard to set goals because um, I don't think there's been a lot of attention to, attention to what happens to us as we age, because no one expected us to live this long. Earl and I am shot probably had the same experience. I was told I'd be dead at 40 and I'm 68. So I'm not dead. And um, 
as Bill Polonsky said, isn't, doesn't that just make you happy? Yes, it does. But what's going to happen when my husband's not here? What's going to happen when I'm in the hospital? And I can tell you, it is hospital experiences are across the board terrifying. I got an email last night from someone in England who said, thank you for this. We are terrified here. And I thought they had hospitalists that work with T1Ds in the hospital. Hospitals can kill you if you're a T1D and it can happen fast. So we're scared. And now with COVID, we don't even have our advocate there. Um, and who is our advocate? Um, it's a spouse, um, but spouses die, spouses get dementia. Um, and nursing facilities or care homes have no interest or understanding of how to deal with type one diabetes, nor do they have the time. And I'm hearing horror stories and it's frightening. So goal setting is, I pray we work something better for hospitals that take advantage and protect us. And which I don't expect, but then we have to protect ourselves possibly. Um, I would love ed education and that'll come probably from the nursing community into um, care facilities, nurses who understand this disease and how to manage it. Um, I've, when I've been a patient, I've done in services where all the nurses come in and say, what is that device? How does that work? Um, and you know, it's fabulous that Michelle and Nancy are here because I think that's gonna be probably part of the auxiliary care that we will need. Um, I, I, I don't expect much from doctors other than hospital care because they, they have a different approach. They have to take care of the medical condition, not necessarily the psychosocial and this, the life planning skills. So um, I look at that and, and all the resources, financial issues. Um, I think we really need to look at this, set it up, set up systems so people know how to prepare themselves. A lot of people don't do this. Like I don't like to because it's scary and there's no good answer. So we don't do it. Uh, you know, they'd rather wait and they say the hospital will take care of me. And I'm saying, no, 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 it will not. Um, so we, we need a louder voice on this for advocacy. And, and just real quickly along those lines, um, I asked a local hospital to do wristbands that said type one diabetes like allergic to penicillin fall risk. And I was told that would take five to 10 years to get through uh, compliance. So I printed them up. I, it's, I got 500 for $75 and I give them to all my friends who, if you have a go bag that you would go to the hospital, slap a wristband on, that way they won't take that off, it's not jewelry. And uh, over de in December, one of my local support group people ended up in the hospital, slapped his wristband on. He said it was an absolute topic of conversation. It helped people understand he was different. It stood out, it was bright teal. And why is that so hard? Mm -hmm. Identify us at least, if you're not gonna give us an advocate in the hospital, let our wrist speak for us. Yeah. Um Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Lichman, I know that um, across the board, language matters, the words we use matter as we talk about everything, but in particular for this conversation, diabetes. I wonder just even given the context of the question and how I framed it to Joanne, if maybe goal setting is not the right language, maybe expectation management might be a better approach, but I mean, how do you, what is your take on sort of the provider um, side of that equation when it comes to engaging with patients around whatever objectives or goals or targets or however you wanna frame it might be? Yeah, I think one of the things that is important is the language that the individual likes to use. So providers, yes, we're using goal setting. Researchers do too. One of the things that we came across when we did some community engagement work recently is instead of a goal, it was what do you want to be different in the next three months? And when people had it framed in that way. Um, sometimes people were more interested. I also think that a lot of us are really focused on what we call SMART goals. Um, and one of the things that a social worker that works with us talks about is that the M is supposed to be measurable, but he likes to frame it as meaningful. And so there are things that uh, are meaningful to us that, um, that frame how we think about goals or how we want things to be different. And then also having some flexibility built into that because not every day is going to be the same. And so there is this kind of language component of some people may be put off by the idea of a, of a goal, um, but maybe what they want to be different in the next three months could be 
another way to frame it. I like that. Um, Dr. Hirsch, as you work with your colleagues across the University of Washington, you have both your professional experience, but also your personal experience. Um, how do those factor into how you collaborate with your colleagues to collaborate with your patients around, you know, identifying what your patients would like to see be different three to six months from whenever you're seeing them? Well, there's a lot to peel off with all of these discussions. And, and, and I think I could take up the whole time answering <laughs> this and, and expanding on, on, on the previous two answers. I think the biggest point here though is communication for the patient that the patient understands and then communicating that with the providers and understanding that the targets, the goals, the discussion has to be specific for that person and that person's family. And the problem with standards of care, and I used to write the ADA standards of care I'm now involved with endocrine society on the inpatient side. I'm still involved with ACEs. The problem is, is that we make these recommendations, but they can't apply to everybody. They're just generalizations. And, and this is a huge point. I'll give you, I saw, I saw a patient earlier today as an example, a 79 year old man who, since I last saw this patient and appropriately so, his cardiologist, not in the UW system, started him on a full dose beta blocker. And the patient realized he doesn't feel his lows like he used to, he uses a CGM, but I, the cardiologist did not explain to the patient that this would take away his perceptions of hypoglycemia and that we needed to make adjustments on his alarm for his CGM. And I didn't wanna take him off the beta blocker, he needed it for his heart disease, but there just wasn't communication there. And so it may very well be that his targets uh, on his CGM and his overall targets needed to be changed because he has a lot of severe hypoglycemia history. And the typical cardiologist doesn't even think about that. Um, and it's not because they don't care, it's just that it's not part of what they do. And so, you know, I will talk to the cardiologist. I will, we had a long talk with the patient. But the key point here is individualization based on that patient's needs at that time. And that can change and it can change a lot, um, whether elderly or, or not. The other thing that happened just before this, um, just before this uh, uh, webinar took place is that I received another e-care message from a patient who was referred by his PCP for a colonoscopy. And as it turns out, they gave him no recommendations at all. And they said they would not check his blood sugar while he is under anesthesia, stuff like that. And so you have to deal with the system. You have to deal with the doctors. You have to deal with the patients and you have to deal with the different cultures of the medical system in that community, which is different from system to system and community to community. And that's what makes this so challenging is that it has to be individualized because it is, it is so different. And at the end of the day, safety is the most important thing that I have to deal with. Uh, Dr. Allen, I saw you nodding a lot and also shaking your head a lot. Um, I don't know where, I don't know how we're all going to react to all these responses just because there's so much that's being discussed here. There's obviously such a broad topic that is ripe for discussion, very valuable discussion, but uh, your initial reaction to the sort of um, focal point around the initial sort of expectation management conversation between patient and provider. Yeah, we have so much work to do, don't we? Um, it, did that just kind of like come out of this whole discussion? And, you know, certainly in my practice, um, you know, working with older adults, we always had a designated care partner um, at every clinic appointment uh, that they would come in with. And then together, um, you know, every single appointment was providing some component of education to that patient and care partner about how to prevent going to the hospital, um, but then what to do if you were hospitalized as well. Because, and, and I, I shouldn't say this because I'm a nurse, um, but hospitals can just be terrible places, just like Joanne said, for people with diabetes. And, and then that comes back to, we have so much work to do. So, you know, 
working with patients, working with care partners, creating that education is, is critically important. But then I think that for us, um, we have got to do, we got to set goals for educating um, all the people who interact with uh, individuals that are living with diabetes and, and providing that education to them. And the thing that's you know, really striking, and a lot of people don't understand this, is that as you grow older with diabetes, there are age-related changes. Now, oftentimes I don't like to talk about age-related changes. I'll just say, well, you've become more experienced in life and kind of take away some of that stigma about, yeah, you're growing older, right? Um, but, but there are some changes that occur and it's just kind of what Dr. Hirsch was talking about, that hypoglycemia unawareness is just a huge problem as you grow older. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. Um, you know, there can be all kinds of other age-related changes that become problematic um, as, as you get more experience. And that, that is the changes in your vision, um, the changes in your mobility. Um, and, you know, all of these changes come together and they create difficulties for taking care of and doing your own self-care um, they don't always, but they can. And so then you have to be cognizant, like when you're talking about technology. So what are some adaptions that you can use uh, when, you're, when you're doing this? Um, you know, we definitely have got to get um, healthcare providers on board and using things like continuous glucose monitoring. It shouldn't have been a surprise, Joanne, but in the hospital setting uh, to protect patients. One of the I just reflect on everybody's input on this initial question. And then Dr. Hirsch, you mentioned standards of care. And um, I've been reading Invisible Women, which details in painstaking detail how across multiple industries, the, the default male experience is sort of the default applied to everybody, including women, and how that's really just a terrible thing across the board. But I wonder in terms of the standards of care for people with diabetes, um, where have you identified um, the sort of the biggest gaps between what has been documented as standards of care for the typical, I would imagine, male age, you know, 18 to 40 or whatever, versus um, any person with diabetes that is much older than that. Like, where do you, where do you identify, where have you seen the gaps in that? Where do you see that there's plenty of room for improvement in terms of identifying those different sort of perspectives? Is, is, is this for me? I'm going to start with you, but um, okay, again, great, this is great. enough we're going to go so, across the board. So there, there are, there are two, two big issues, and they're both huge general. In the clinic here at the University of Washington and our Diabetes Institute, what I'm going to describe, we used to see once a week, we now see every day. I saw this yesterday in a 48-year-old woman who is the wife of a faculty member here, and that is misdiagnosing type 2 diabetes when they really are type 1. We see it every day. Um, this is a woman who actually from an outside provider was put on a control IQ um, and, and she's doing okay, but she's still on the metformin that the original PCP put her on five years ago. And um, the misinformation in the community when they see a patient, an adult with type one diabetes and they start them on metformin because that's what you're supposed to do. Um, we now know from the JDRF that about half of newly diagnosed type ones are adults, half. And I would say the majority of them, by far the majority are misdiagnosed. So that's big problem number one, that we need a lot of work. Big problem number two gets back to what was mentioned before, but that's inpatient hospital care. Now we are very fortunate. We have an inpatient glycemic team that we set up about 15 years ago. And if you have type one diabetes, I am sure that we will make sure all of your needs are catered to, whether you're on an insulin that's not covered, a device that we want you to stay on or not. We're about to start a multi-center CGM trial within the next month. If everything goes right, we're very excited about that. But yet on the other hand, I had a patient enter the hospital um, last month she was in ketoacidosis. It was a community hospital. 
And the first thing they did was throw away her CGM with her Dexcom transmitter. It was literally thrown into the garbage. And she went without CGM for three weeks after her discharge. And the amount of misinformation, diseducation, un and, and knowledge in the community on T1D, it, it, it's actually getting worse and more disparate because as our treatments and technologies get better, it's not reaching the community physicians and the hospitalists, and they mean well. They mean well, but we're not doing a very good job at catching them up with where we are, let alone where we're going. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't have the best segues out of some of these. So I'm just going to do a hard pivot to some questions from the chat. Thank you, attendees. Um, I guess raise your hand if you want to chime in on this one. This first one comes in from Tony. Thank you, Tony. Um, diabetes is really tough uh, for people who aren't good at math um, because the numbers obviously are critical to all this. What are your thoughts? So everybody on the panel, we can figure out who wants to go first. What are your thoughts on how to make continuous glucose monitor data relevant and relatable to people's lives? Um, this is something that apparently Tony is actually working on right now. But in terms of um, turning that data, those action, you know, making that data actionable and meaningful for somebody who might not necessarily have math um, as a strong point or have that sort of numeracy as a strong point uh, in their lives. Anybody want to? You can take that one. So one of the things that I've done is, you know, a lot of times we provide someone with like this correction scale and sometimes it's a, a calculation, they have to do the math. But one of the things that I routinely do is I actually do the math for the carb counts for them if they need it. So if you are on a one to nine ratio, you know, it'll say take this many units for nine carbs, this many units for up to 18 carbs. So I'll actually do the math for them. And then I have them either take a picture of it or cut it out and stick it in their wallet. So at least the carb counting component is a little bit easier. They still have to do the, the actual counting of the carbs, but they don't have to do the calculation piece. Um, the other thing that I've done on occasion is um, I've actually done fixed dosing for some people. And, and do it as a small, medium, or large meal. And so there are some people who um, might have some liter numeracy issues that might need to have a little bit more of a fixed dosing. The other component is what Nancy described is a care partner. So if there's somebody who can be providing some support, and we do this with kids, right? Sometimes a kid will text their parent, I'm gonna eat this and this for lunch today, and how much insulin should I take? And so there are some instances in which a care partner might be valuable in the dosing calculation piece. I like that, I like that. Um, Joanne, I'm gonna throw this next question to you. There have been a couple of come in from the chat. Uh, I don't think I can get everybody's names right away, but broadly speaking around how to ed meaningfully educate and advocate for yourself in that hospital setting, again, given all the challenges we've already described, given the challenges that you've documented that everybody may experience one way or another, what have been the most efficient or effective ways that you've seen or that you've used to advocate for yourself for the technology you're actively using? How do you sort of create um, a bridge in that gap of knowledge that you obviously have the immense amount of knowledge as a patient trying to communicate that effectively to the folks who are gonna be caring for you in that setting? Um, what, what I've been talking about for the last five or six years, and certainly since COVID, is preparedness. Just be prepared. Don't, and being prepared doesn't mean it's going to happen. Um, it just means being prepared. And, and that's an interesting issue that we can talk about that because not everyone's willing to do that. But it's set up your go bag. And I, I have a website, and there's a whole little topic section on T1D preparedness. It's very simple. It's just, you have to do some things. And a lot of diabetics say, uh, or people with diabetes say that, um, you know, I already have enough to do. Well, this, this is really important if you end up in the hospital. So you, you set up a go bag, you have a backpack or a bag near the door, ready to go that, that your partner knows that's your go bag bag and it has all your supplies. It has glucose in it. It has uh, testing strips. It takes extra sensors for your CGM, batteries for your devices. Um, I've spoken to people and they say, well, I'm not going to bring juice because they'll bring me juice. No, they will not bring you juice, particularly in times of COVID. They're busy and they hear a request for juice and they think you're thirsty. Um, and they are, it's not the urgency that you feel, which is I'm shaky, I need juice. So bring your own. 
I also tell people, bring your own insulin because a lot of hospitals don't have the orders in place to get their insulin. And if you have your CGM saying, I need insulin, it can take you hours if you don't have your own. I don't try to run around the rules of the hospital, but my needs are higher than the hospital's needs. And it, so if I have my own stuff, then I can use it. So a go bag. I have a, a, a little a packet that I put together called a personal medical resume. It's all your stuff, including a letter to the caregiver in your hospital. And that could be the front pages. I have type one diabetes. Read this. And in red, it's important. I take insulin. I use this. This is what how I manage my diabetes. These are my comorbidities so that I take other medications. And then Behind that are your, the medications you take, the, um, when you take your pills, because uh, the pharmacist doesn't know when you take things and also doesn't know if they're essential or just supplements. Um, it's being prepared for yourself because imagine you can't tell someone how to manage you. You have tubes in you and your advocate doesn't know or isn't in the hospital, have this document that says, here, look, this is what I do. These are my doctors. This is how to reach people. It, it, it can be done um, electronically. It can be online. But if you're in the hospital, they're not going to go to their computer and look it up. So a document, an actual something they see. The wristband, it's so simple. I, it's the simplest thing I know how to do to say, this is what I need. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just being prepared, ready to go out the door. Um, my go bag has a little baby go bag in the refrigerator in the butter compartment, as we keep all our insulin in the butter, butter compartment that says, take this with the go bag, you know, and this is my insulin, this is my um, uh, uh, injectable glucose or vaccine, something that I need to protect me because I cannot expect the hospital understands what I need, has the time to do what I need, um, that I have someone there that is, has my back. I don't assume that. And my experience tells me I absolutely don't have that. And one more thing, if they talk to you about pulling off your pump or your CGM scream like bloody murder, and if they mention sliding scale scream, uh, sliding scale doesn't work. It's not, there's no real basis in it. Hospitals use it, particularly the less university-based hospitals and it it's, doesn't work. So um, you need to really be as aware as you can. Um, it, that's the best I can do. I, I, I'd love to educate the hospital systems, but they're now owned by big corporations and there's their compliance issues and concerns. And, and I could care less about those. I care about being safe in the hospital when I'm in their care. And, and we're taught from day one, the word control. You know, how do you manage diabetes? You have control. Th that word is so, so big. And when you go to the hospital, you lose control. They take over and as best as possible, work with them, try not to let them take over, but work with them, educate them. That's the best I can say. Yeah. I, I do also love the fact that your go bag has a go bag. Um, I find that really adorable. Uh, I, I guess question for the provider side of things, given the limitations, the requirements, the restrictions, everything about working in a hospital system setting, are there things that the other providers watching this webinar, either live or watching the recorded archive might keep in mind whenever they are presented with a patient that has gone through the, the process of preparing a go bag with a bolded, all caps, red letter document detailing the things that need to be cared. Like, is there a way to effectively communicate? I hear you. I have received this. I will make sure that we are respectful of that. Is there, is there anything that can be done besides saying, I hear you to sort of try to, um, I don't want to say calm. That's, that's very, um, this is kind of disrespectful, but to, again, to acknowledge that connection that you're making with your patient as they're coming in, is there anything that can be done there to try and improve that? There's one aspect of this that's being proactive and trying to set up protocols that allow for pumps and CGMs in the first place. So you don't have to be reactive to a patient that's coming in. So if you have those in place, that can actually be helpful. There's also something called the inpatient um, diabetes care certificate that hospitals can acquire. There's only about three to 5% of them that have it. It's a JACO component, um, which is kind of the certifying body that says we're doing a good job with our hospital system. And so there are some hospitals that do have this certificate. There's one here in Utah, but it's um, 
it, there is a process to be to train the dietetics team it, the, to to train the nursing team, the physician team, everybody that could touch potentially touch a patient with in the ER, the ICU, everywhere. Um, they have to have a special training on how you take care of an individual with diabetes, whether you have type one or type two. And so if we could get hospital systems to become um, more interested in acquiring these certificates, I think that we'll have a, a, a healthcare system that's better equipped to provide services for, for the patients and the needs that they have. We know that um, there is increasing use of technology across the board, not just with type one, but also with type two. And so we need a system that's that understands what these devices are. Um, similar to Dr. Hirsch, I had a patient uh, transmitter go in the garbage at, when they were in rehab at a nursing home. And so we need to make sure that people understand what these devices are, what pieces not to throw away so, because they're sometimes insurance doesn't cover them very quickly. And um, so I think being uh, proactive in trying to address these issues before it becomes a problem where you have to be reactive is the most critical thing that you could do today. Yeah. The thing I'm mindful currently uh, and the bias of my personal experience is that the biggest challenge I have with somebody external identifying the importance of the device I'm wearing is the TSA. Remember when we used to fly places in the before times and I had to worry about the pat down for my insulin pump. That was the whole yeah. thing. Uh, but again, that's my limited experience. So again, I thank you all for bridging, or not bridging it, for expanding my uh, expectation and understanding of what's taking place here. Um, I, Can I just um, answer oh, yeah, go ahead, Joanne. Yeah, Michelle yeah. said, um, is there any way of telling hospitals if you pull a device, not to try to tell them which ones not to throw away, don't throw away anything. Put it, put it in a, in a um, sanitary Ziploc and keep it. You don't know enough. They're in the middle of an emergency. Just for heaven's sakes, don't pitch something that's on on body. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Lichman is following up. Is that jointcommission.org for the JCO? Yeah, Advanced I just put a couple of I just put yeah, a couple so, of things in the chat box. Hopefully that yeah. link that they can open it. Yeah, I can't click on it, but for the people yeah. recording, watching the archive, advanced certification requirements for inpatient diabetes care. That is a lot of fun there. Um, yeah, that, right, so that there, link is a Chrome extension, so it, yeah. it won't work. Yeah. We will get there. For folks, I, I, I will I'll make a note to put a link in the description of the YouTube archives. That means you have to come back. This is how I'm going to get you to stay on board with what we're offering here. Um, all right, questions in the chat keep coming, but I want to come back to one that I already had written down just because I'm biased. I work here. You see the team, the background. We make this software that visualizes diabetes device data. I think it's great. Again, I work here, um, but I am mindful of the opportunities for improvement to the accessibility of our software in particular, let alone broader diabetes tools and technology. Um, I don't know who wants to go first, but where are there opportunities for improvement for the accessibility of diabetes tools and technology that you've seen um, based off your personal and professional experiences? Joanne, I imagine you might have thoughts on the accessibility of diabetes tools and technology. I thought that's actually a really tough one, and I think it will improve over time um, as closed loop systems become easier and, and less um, patient intensive or caregiver intensive. Um, but so, I mean, we, we have in our, our little community, we've, we've talked about cheat sheets, just little, a little booklet of, uh, and it should be in every floor of every hospital. How do I take care of a type one diabetic? And, and you flip through it, oh, they had that device. Okay, this is what I need to know. These are the links to their website to understand um, because there is a lot of information, but it, a little cheat sheet guide would help. And th there aren't that many pages of it. It's, it's basics, uh, what to put in an IV and what not to put. Do not put glucose, do not put steroid. A simple, but one page cheat sheet. Um, they might have a device that looks like this or this or this, if they do, do not take it off. And if it looks like this, this is a Medtronic. If it looks like this, this is the Dexcom. Um, and I want to do with it. They're, they should already know, but um, we live in cosmopolitan areas and um, highly educated hospital systems for the most part. A lot of people don't, and they don't know what these are. So cheat sheets, uh, it's the fastest, easiest little go-to for people um, until, oh my gosh, who, um, Earl, you said you have a, a team um, of T1D specialists. I was a faithful friend to a hospital and she had sepsis. And within two seconds, these two people showed up with hoodies and backpacks and it said the sepsis team. 
And I said, who are you? And they said, we take over, we're in charge. And I, and I looked at it and thought, I want a T1D team. And you have it, Earl, that is so cool. I have not heard that anywhere else. I asked a local hospital to do that and they laughed. Um, I don't need a team, I need one. I, need, I don't need a doctor, I need a nurse practitioner or someone who understands and can be the essential partner in the hospital system. Dr. Hirsch, you are currently muted. All good. I'm it's sorry. not a Zoom call without somebody saying yeah, you need yes, to mute. Yes, thank you. Um, if I can say a few, a, a few things, because there, there's a lot, um, again, to peel back. Um, yes, we have an inpatient hospital team. We have, because of our clinic, we have a huge number of people with type 1 diabetes who end up in the hospital. And again, we did this because it was a safety issue between the transplants and the regular issues why people come in the hospital for their appendectomies and everything. But as I'm listening to Joanne, I'm thinking, of course we have a diabetes team. And of course they're very knowledgeable in type one diabetes. It's, it's no different than if you came into the hospital and you were about to deliver a baby and you needed a C-section, you'd want somebody for that. It's, it's, it's really kind of no different. You, you, you need to have the expertise. And, and one of the problems why things have actually gotten worse in the last couple of years, which nobody has said, but it has made things worse, is we are dealing with, through nobody's fault, so many traveling nurses who, because of COVID, and the nurses are short, they're short staffed because of COVID, and they're coming into a system and they may not be completely familiar with the, the culture. That is a huge, huge issue. The other Two points. Uh, point number one is the fact that I hear Joanne loud and clear about the whole sliding scale issue. This has been my, my personal um, uh, topic for the last 30 plus years. And, um, but what's happened is, is if you go to the literature and you look at the data for it, everybody defines it differently. Everybody uses it differently. We are moving now towards the whole topic of correction dose insulin, which has a different definition and a different connotation. And this will all be made clear in the new Endocrine Society guidelines, which will be out um, later in the spring. Um, that's point number one. And then the final point I wanna make, what we really need ideally is we, it, we, we not only need simplicity, simplicity in terms of all this technology to make it easy, but ideally, we have it so that, and this is not going to ever happen, we have one platform. I am not, I am agnostic to Type Pool or any of the competitors, but every company has their own um, native platform for their downloading. And because I'm in this big giant diabetes clinic, we have to deal with all of them. But the average primary care physician and the average community endocrinologist doesn't have the bandwidth to do what we do. And this is part of the problem um, with geriatrics and pediatrics and everything in between. We've made it too complicated as these devices continue to be approved and more are on the way. Uh, the Sensionics device was their, their uh, six month device, 180 day was approved today. I think that's great for that population that wants to use it, but everybody needs different software for looking at the data. And that to me is a huge problem and why not everybody is able to benefit from this explosion of wonderful technology that I did not have or my brother didn't have when we were kids. I uh, swear that wasn't a plant, but in case anybody that's, out that's there wants to think. learn about Tidepool, that, that's, that's what I think. I'm here. <laughs> in case anybody wants to learn, Tidepool.org, you can get in contact with me as a member of the clinic success team of one. Um, happy to walk anybody question? through it. Got it. Go ahead, Joanne. I don't want to get Can back over. I a question that came from Weaver Greenberg. Um, how do we incentivize the caregivers, the healthcare professionals to want to learn? How, you know, do we have to pay them to learn this? Um, what, what do we do? Because type one diabetes takes a lot of time. These devices take a lot of time. There's a huge amount of data. At some point there'll be expert systems. Why they're not here now, I don't know. But um, there, there should be expert systems that can identify the data immediately and tag someone. And it doesn't have to be the endo, but the caregivers. How do we 
get them to push this forward so that the system works better. Any takers? Well, you know, I there's this, I don't know if you've ever heard of Project Echo, where, you know, you can call in and, and um, do a consult on a, on a complicated patient. Um, you know, in a perfect world, you would be able to access them 24 seven and say, I got a patient, this is the scenario, what do I do? Um, and it would be nationwide, one place with all the experts, as opposed to this system has it, this system doesn't. But, you know, I mean, of course, then people will accuse me of being a socialist, right? Um, but, <laughs> you know, it's, it's truly, it, we need to develop a way that people, providers, nurses, can access 24 seven, the information they need when they're confronted with a situation they don't understand. And the problem is, is when you get into the hospital settings, you know, oftentimes you are so sick, you cannot be in charge of your own care. And so you have to rely on them. And so this is the point where, you know, it's Great. I love the idea, Joanne, of having and being proactive. It's so important. I mean, I harp on this. I'm actually thinking as we're talking, you know, every person needs to have a video. This is what I do on my sick days. You know, this is how I manage my diabetes, you know, <laughs> so that the, the person who's taking care of you could really get to know you and how, what you need. When I get a steroid injection, this is how much insulin I need proactively. So I don't, you know, have a serious high. Um, and that just goes along with the patient centered. But, but truly, I do think that we have got to have some resources. We can keep, I mean, the American Diabetes Association, um, as well as the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists, they have a lot of webinars. Um, you know, there's webinars and there's training programs and there's certificate programs out there for primary care. You know, we've got information out there. It's a matter of information and, you know, that's information. Now, then you've got to have that knowledge so that you can use it, that you can apply it. And that's the piece that I think is a struggle. Um, and that's where I just, I feel like, yeah, we need to do a lot better in nursing, nurse practitioner, PA, uh, physician education, because truly it's about eight hours and it's usually around diabetic ketoacidosis versus really, you know, manage, managing somebody in the hospital or in the outpatient setting. There's just not that level of training or education that's currently happening. Um, and so that's when I go to, I think we need some, uh, you know, some centralized resources. Wouldn't it be great if the American Diabetes Association had a number that you could just call and you could talk to somebody 24 <laughs> seven. I, I would also say, wouldn't it be great if there were diabetes software that integrated everything in just one location and it was free and available from a nonprofit organ. Wait, tidepool.org, sorry. Um, Dr. Lichman, I, so as we're rounding out, we're about 15 minutes left in the webinar. I do want to try and not pivot, but acknowledge that. Um, and this actually came in from the chat. Thank you, Jerry, for coming, you know, for making this comment. A lot of what we've been hearing about today is the question is really, how do we keep hospital staff from hurting us? Not so much, how do we get them to help us? So um, shout out to Jerry McGuire. Are, are, are there opportunities for identifying um, some sort of success stories, strategies that, um, that have worked in the past that you've seen work that you think that can collectively, we can all sort of take forward and build upon in terms of building that foundation, building that connection, um, making those meaningful um, sort of relationships, even if they are in a hospital setting, as scary as they may be, like where's opportunity for, for those connections, for that empathy to actually build? What has worked? What can we try and focus on collectively um, as, a, as a community? Yeah, one of the things that I think has been really eye-opening for providers um, or clinicians at all levels is when they do a simulation of living with diabetes. And so there are some people who have worn CGM, who have worn an insulin pump, who have to do the carb counting. We did a study where we did this simulation, but someone with type 1 diabetes was feeding that clinician random blood sugars that they had to deal with. And it made them stop and think about like how much thinking goes in into having diabetes and managing all the different parts of having diabetes. And so I think simulation is a really good way to 
educate healthcare providers who are especially new and coming up. I think updating textbooks is really important. Um, I just got done revising uh, a book chapter on diabetes. It's a popular medical surgical book that's used in nursing, and it was really outdated, really, really outdated. So I think making sure whoever is, is um, in charge of these textbooks that all levels of, of healthcare providers from physician to, to physical, uh, physical therapy, all of them, they need to be updated with the latest technology so people know that they exist and that they're coming to their hospital system and they need to be aware that of what they are. And um, I think those are two big things. You know, a lot of us have to stay up to date with our education through CME or CEUs. And so making opportunities available where we can, where people can try devices, I think can be helpful and uh, making sure that people get credit for it, I think will, um, will be even more encouraging. I think having some of this placed in big, um, big conferences that people are already attending. So like for a family practice, it would be, um, you know, AAFP for nursing, it would be another organization. So I think that making sure that it's really reaching the emergency room physicians, the ICU physicians, all of the different people that touch the healthcare system, not just ADA and ADCES, where we already know those people are already interested and invested in diabetes. We need to reach out to the other organizations where they're invested in healthcare, but maybe not specifically diabetes. I like that. I'm going to keep pivoting um, based off some feedback from the chat. Thank you, chat. This is from both Laddie and Chris Cannon in the chat. Um, we've been talking a lot about the hospital setting specifically. Um, as Chris notes, um, this is only one part of the challenge. Diabetes goes home with us as well. As Laddie notes, what about um, uh, T1D cares, um, T1D cares, excuse me, in nursing homes? Plenty of other settings that we can address. Obviously, an hour long webinar is not going to be able to address all of this meaningfully. Um, but anybody on the panel, thoughts around um, different approaches or different things to consider with respect to potentially, you know, nursing homes or, or assisted living um, facilities as it relates to diabetes, where there might be a little more, um, a, a different type of care, different type of interaction between, I guess we call them the customer, patient, um, and, and the providers at the, and, and the staffing there. Thoughts, anybody? So, you know, I'll, I'll oh, go ahead, Dr. Hirsch. Did you want to go? I'll, I'll, I'll just start. And, and I'll just say, um, we have a long way to go. <laughs> that has been made very um, clear. Thank you all for your uh, input on this. We have a long way to go. Um, I didn't even get all my comments in about the inpatient, but this is even a longer way to go. I mean, I write a rant every year. Um, it came out last month for diabetes technology and therapeutics. And in the rant, I talked about a patient who was in an uh, acute um, adult living facility. Um, and I don't know if it was a, a nursing home or I just don't remember. It was not my patient. It was a patient of one of my colleagues. And what it is, is that most of these places will only give insulin twice a day, mm -hmm. twice a day. And so if they, and, and I was approached because they said, unless you're on a pump, well, this is somebody who was not appropriate for a pump and the nur the nursing home didn't understand that, the patient's family didn't understand that, but tried to get even four time a day insulin and four time a day glucose testing and forget CGM. I mean, it just, what we need to do is we need to start from scratch. And, and what I think is possible to be done sooner than later, but it would only be available for a few people, just like we did in the hospitals 30, 40 years ago, is you need to have special units in the skilled nursing facilities that are specific for people with diabetes who take insulin. I don't think we're ready yet for a specific type one skilled nursing facility, but we need to have floors that are specific for that where the, uh, the staff is trained. The problem with many of these places is they just don't have enough staffing um, even to give insulin if the, you know, and, and that's what you need. Um, and so, how many times over the years have I seen iatrogenic ketoacidosis, um, severe hypoglycemia with seizures? Again, I come back to safety. We are not talking about getting the A1C to 6.8 with a coefficient of variation of 30. It's getting the insulin in and making sure everybody is safe and healthy. And we have a long way to go. And it's, it's a topic that as the type one population ages, 
which is a good thing, as Joanne said at the very beginning, this is this is a tsunami waiting to happen. And in this part of healthcare, in uh, the skilled nursing facilities, the nursing homes, um, it has not yet happened and it has not been addressed, at least that I have seen. And maybe somebody can correct me and tell me I have it all wrong and it actually is working fine in their community because not where I live. It is not working well. It is expensive if you're even admitted into a care facility. They very, very often they won't even take type ones. Um, but they, they charge a premium. Where are these people going to get the money? Where is Medicare going to support it? Um, it's ter the, the one word I have for it is terrifying. And yes, it is a tsunami. Uh, we are aging into this and this wave is coming. And with COVID, there are new diagnoses of type 1 diabetes. There are more in the world. And yes, um, Dr. Hirsch, we are we are rolling into this and no, I can't tell you it's better. I can tell you the stories I've gotten in the last 24 hours. Um, someone's partner works for care, care facilities and says, how do I do this? I don't know how to do this. Someone else's grandmother's in the hospital and he's calling them all the time, give her insulin, I'm getting alerts. Um, I don't know, how, it's huge, you're right, terrifying. I think one of the things to also consider with this is the nursing ratios. So when you are in a nursing home taking care of patients during a day shift, you might have 15 people to take care of and then at night up to 30. And so nursing ratios have been a, a, an issue in nursing for a very long time. And it, you know, it, it, it trickles down into SNFs and the care that you receive, it trickles to the hospital as well. And the care you receive, if you've got too many people to take care of, what are the things that you can do? <sighs> And see, I want to give you a, a final thought and then I'm going to give Joanne the final, final thought before I close this out. Um, it's, it's been quite a roller coaster. Any, any final thoughts from you on everything we've talked about for the past hour? Yeah. So, so the one thing that I'm going to kind of add to this whole conversation is that um, people with diabetes have a higher incidence of developing memory problems and dementia. And it's, it's a significant amount. Um, and so this problem, I mean, we have got to get on top of it now, because as you said, uh, the number of people that are aging with diabetes is growing in numbers. And so I would just say there's a certain urgency here. Mm -hmm. And really for those that are living with diabetes to, to get a proactive plan together and to try and think about, you know, how they're going to safely age uh, with diabetes. Thank you for that. Uh, Joanne, there was a comment or one of the questions that came in asking about what um, the dazzling you've done to your insulin pump as you think of a final <laughs> thought for this webinar. Um, I don't know if you want to put that up to the camera, but just people are noticing your sure, flame. It's, it's just an Omnipod and it's, yeah. a, it's a cheap little stick on um, bling. Um, I sometimes decorate pods because we were stuck wearing them and, um, and why not? Um, I usually will decorate while I'm sitting on the phone for hours with insurance. Um, and that's another whole topic because people are getting prior offs and saying, we don't cover your insulin, but we suggest you take a statin instead. So that's another whole world of problem. And as you age, you get confused by this and you lose the desire to keep fighting insurance. So um, yeah, but anyway, it's bling, Reba. <laughs> so it's, just, it's just for fun. So one final question for you, Joanne, before we close out here, um, despite everything we've talked about, all very important that we talk about, is there anything recently um, that has given you hope about aging with diabetes? Yes, this, this webinar, yes. Um, oh. Working with Nancy and Michelle, um, and we actually have a meeting after this with several T aging T1Ds who were really just trying to get a gauge of wh what bubbles to the top, what are the, what are the, piles that are real important. It's a huge problem. And I'm so grateful that people are actually paying attention. When I started this five years ago, um, I was, I was, so what's the problem? You know, it, it, this is the problem. And, it, and it is terrifying because we're used to managing ourselves. And like so I, I'm grateful for this webinar. Thank you, Syrah, for, for setting this up. Thank you, Christopher. Um, Yes, for everyone paying attention. If I end up in the hospital, I want to be at the University of Washington. That's my plan. I'll tell my husband that. We'll get tickets. Um, I, I, I want to be safe. 
and that's really the important part. Right on. Um, people have been asking throughout this webinar. I would just give a shout out to the savvydiabetic.com, two V's. If you want to get in contact with Joanne and see what she is up to. Uh, my final thought is that um, as I do the full view over here, hi. Um, I don't have all the answers. We definitely don't have all the answers, but I actually do believe in Typo's capacity to bring people together to try and identify the problem. Maybe Typo can actually contribute to the solution, but uh, there's clearly a lot more that we can do to understand what's taking place and begin to work on those solutions. I look forward to having a few more of these conversations. Um, maybe not all of them will be doom and gloom, but at the very least, we have to be real about what's taking place before we can identify solutions. So um, thank you everybody on the panel for coming and sharing your stories, your experiences with us. Thank you everybody in attendance as I point to this nebulous sidebar over here. Um, apologies to everybody in the chat who couldn't get their questions answered, but as you can imagine, we had a lot to cover and we did so very efficiently in an hour. Um, so again, typepool.org, if you have questions about anything you've seen related to the awesome software we have, in case you wanna work on that, that's cool. Um, and yeah, there will be the recording, um, the link will go out for the archive for anybody, uh, for anybody who missed it. Um, again, Dr. Hirsch, Dr. Allen, Dr. Lichman, and Joanne, most importantly, patients are people too. Um, this has been another Typo webinar. We'll see you at another one, hopefully sometime soon. Have a great day, everybody.